for all L1, uh, big L is my big L. Uh, no, N. Sorry. So it's uh, a product of little n matrices. So this is for all little n, where which involves the index of the matrices. I just uh, specifying which matrix I consider for each term of the product. And if I consider the matrix itself or its adjoint for all epsilon one, epsilon n in one star. So if epsilon is one, it means I put the matrix to the power one, the, the matrix. If the epsilon is star, I just mean I consider the, uh, the, uh, the transpose on this adjoint. Okay. All these numbers, all the function, or this in the left hand side, you can put this is a kind of moment. So I do not L, M like Mark, but it's not, it does not depend just on, a, on the power I consider here, but it consider here the data epsilon one and n. Voilà. For each n, for each family of L's and each family of epsilons, we have a number that we do not M uh, patati patata, which is this one. Okay. Why do we care? Because remind you, I remind you that we want to understand the spectrum of a matrix HN, which is written as a polynomial in several matrices. So I start like this, P of A1, AL. And imagine you want to understand the eigenvalue distribution of this guy and start by computing its moments. We want to compute. So we have the empirical eigenvalue distribution of HN. We want to compute its moment. So we apply it to the function uh, X to some power K. What does that mean? It just means that we consider the expectation of one over n, the sum of these uh, eigenvalues of uh, Hn to the power k. Okay, but if we assume that the matrix is Hermitian and we do that, this is equal to the expectation of one over n, the trace of the matrix Hn to the power k. Okay, just relating the eigenvalue with the trace. That's good. Now, Hn is a polynomial in one AL. So it is a uh, Hn to the K is also a polynomial in uh, A1 AL. You can write this guy as the expectation of one over n, the trace of a polynomial Q in A1 AL, where Q is a P to the power K, obvious. But this is encoded in the star distribution of a one l This is what we denoted in the right hand side. Phi of the family A apply to Q. Oh, forget about this notation. We don't care. This guy is just a linear combination of guys like this. Conclusion, if you are able to compute the star distribution of your family of ingredients here, and moreover, if you have a nice des uh, description of the star distribution, you can expect to have a nice description of the matrix you're considering here, HN. Okay? So typically, you have a matrix HN, let's say it is a sum of your two ingredients. You see that the moment of uh, this empirical eigenvalue distribution can always be written as a linear combination of trace of products like this. Okay? So this is okay for the uh, conceptual ingredients of the theory. Let's do a little practice and learn a little bit of techniques. No, I don't know if I will have the time in 35 minutes to, to do uh, the whole exercise, but what we want to do is let us compute the limiting star distribution of a family Xn, X1, Xl, of 
independent Wigner matrices. I have already defined Wigner matrices. Okay, so you, you consider several matrices of this type. You don't necessarily need to have the same distribution for the entries when you change from one matrix to another one. And we assume that the variance of, number of extra diagonal entries is one for every matrix. Okay, so let's do that. And we will occupy a little time. And at the end, we will get a nice formula, I claim. And that will be the opportunity for me to introduce you freeness and to compare with uh, Gaussian random variable. Okay, so by definition, if we want to compute the limiting star distribution, we must compute some way the limit when n goes to infinity of the expectation of one over n the trace of a generic uh, star uh, product in this matrices. But because these matrices are Hermitian, you don't need to put the adjunct. So we just need to compute the expectation of the product. X uh, L1 up to X L N. This for all N and for all indices L1 up to L. Okay? With, huh? With, With possible repetition. Okay. Alors, how will we do that? First, we uh, let me organize it. Let's call it M of L1 N. And first, let's describe what we do. First, we do an expansion in terms of entry. Okay, this is a trace of a product. So we can write it explicitly in terms of the entries of the matrices. What does we get? What do we get? ML1 and N. So we have this one over N that I can put in front. The expectation I can put it uh, using linearity in the trace. And this trace of the product, I can interpret it as a, a sum of a multi-index a1, a2, up to uh, a n, from 1 to n. So I have my first matrix. I consider its entry e y1, i2. Don't forget the expectation here. I have the second matrix with uh, a2, a3, and so on, up to the last matrix, L1, with this index a n. And because it's a trace, we finish by considering again this first index. Everyone agrees with that. This is definition of the matrix product and of the trace, okay? Just for the moment, when we have such an expression, we will use graph to make computation. I will define it uh, like this uh, in more details, but when I consider a moment like this, I consider, I, I draw it with a simple cycle. So here I put a lens six, if this little n is six, and I draw my matrices, XL1, XL2, XL3, and so on, XLN. And I just uh, put the same vertex at the end of uh, age and at the beginning of this one, because I have a repetition of index, which appears in this uh, expression. This is very simple. Okay, so now let's compute the large n limit of this guy. First of all, we have matrices, uh, these matrices XLs of the form XAJ to the square root of L. Okay, and this random variable depends on L, but we have this normalization by square root of L. So let's first, uh, because it's easy, factorize this. We have uh, one N here, so N to the minus one. Each entry, for each entry appears a square root of N. So we have minus little n, which is the total number of matrices under consideration, divided by two. Okay, and now I have the same expression. The sum a1, a2, up to a n of the expectation. And now I have this uh, product, but with uh, not capital, but some small letters, which just mean we discard the normalization. I just put a small letter here, and I mean the 
you normalize matrix. And uh, when we do that, the advantage is that by definition, this quantity does not depend on N because we assume today that the Wigner matrix is of this form for a random variable whose distribution is independent on N. So here you have a number. We call it uh, M. No, no, M is already, uh, of, let's say, G of L1, Ln, and of, of I. I is a notation for this multi index. Okay. Where I is A1, In. Right? So it's, it is a value which depends on the matrices under consideration and on the entries. But we have Wigner matrices, which means that we have independence and identical distribution, which means that, in fact, an observation, that these numbers does not really depend on the actual values of these indices. What it depends on is on which indices are equal and which are different. Okay, and this is a strategy we will use today and we will use tomorrow with permutation invariant matrices. So let me, in fact, uh, this V of uh, L1. So it depends on this L, of course, because uh, this is a choice of the matrices, but it depends on this I only through something specific on I that we call the kernel of I. Alors, so, kernel of I. Alors, what is this kernel of I? Let me uh, define it and illustrate this on this blackboard. The kernel of uh, multi-index is a partition. If you have a multi-index uh, I, so of length little n, as we are considering here, the kernel of I is the partition of the integers one, two, up to little n, such that two integers from this set, P and Q, are in the same block of this partition. And this is what I denote. P is equivalent to Q uh, with this relation. If and if the corresponding uh, entries of the multi index are the same. This is my definition. An example if I take the multi index, uh, let's say one, two, okay, the kernel of the multi index. One, two, one, uh, three, two. So this is just a multi index. Okay. So this is a partition. What do I count? I have first, second, third, fourth, and fifth position. F first and third position are in the same, have the same value. So they are in the same block. First and third. Okay. The second one is the same as the last one. So my second index, two, it belongs to the same block as the last one, which is five. And third appears once. So since it appears in the fourth position, four is a singleton. And if I consider this kernel, I get the same kernel if I change the value, the values of my uh, multi-index without modifying the case of equality. So this kernel is the same as kernel as 17 uh, minus two. I put the same 17 here because it's the same value here on five minus two, okay? Okay, well, if you take an expectation of products like this, this guy depends only on the kernel. And you can understand this, it's because we have uh, entries which are identically distributed. So in this matrix, uh, X, one, two, has the same distribution as, uh, 
So minus two does not exist, but this one. They have the same distribution. So if you have a moment in like this, and you have the same value as the same moment. This means that because a lot of terms are the same, we can organize this sum depending on which terms are the same on it. So let's do this. But we will do it using the graph approach because it will be relevant. Uh, here, I was talking about permit, uh, partition of the state one, two, up to, to little n. But now I will be talking about the set of partition of these vertices. They are in bijection, so in bijection, so I don't really care. Okay. So my uh, number uh, M or L1 and N, I will first consider pi, a partition of this vertex set. So V is my vertex set. And it is uh, in bijection with the set uh, uh, little n that we considered earlier. Okay. And now I will sum over. Uh, so I have my uh, constant that I computed before the one over n from the normalized trace minus n over two from the normalization of the matrices. And when I was writing first this sum, I will first, I will write the sum over this multi indices such that the kernel of A is pi. And then I have the same value. There is a question in my back. This guy. Yes. When L1 and L2 are different, yeah. you can have different distribution here. Then why is the value of V only depending on the kernel? Because but because I, I'm not mod modifying this oh, okay. L. I'm just talking about exchanging the value of sure, these sure. indices, not the index for the matrix. Yeah. If it's... you have a different matrices, of course, the entries of one matrix, you don't want to exchange it with yeah. another. We are just really permuting entries of the same matrix, right? Okay, so are we clear with that? This V of L1, Ln pi, is the value of V L1 Ln i for any i which kernel is pi. We say they have common values, so I write the dependence in terms of the big object pi. Okay. What does that mean concretely? It means that you have a sum over indices uh, A1, A2, A3, A6. Okay. When you're doing the sum, when some indices are equal, you will draw the graph where you identify the two vertices which have the same value. Okay. So for all pi partition of this vertex, we'll introduce a new graph. So we call this graph, uh, let's say, little t, because in my mind, it's a test graph. T is for test. Okay, never mind. We'll introduce t pi which is a graph that we obtain by identifying vertices in the same block. It's obtained from T. Should we write this because it's going to be very chaotic? Okay, so I introduce this graph, I will illustrate a little bit, and we will use it to make this computation at this level. Okay, uh, maybe I should not uh, talk like this, but okay, for instance, example if I consider pi the partition where uh, I is uh, one is a, a singleton, 
two and six are in the same block. And uh, let's say uh, that it. The other guys are singleton. Sure. In the summation where you have uh, the multi index i. Yeah. Yeah. So the. the, the I did not finish the computation. No, no. Uh, I meant uh, the, the, the summoned, the, the v's do not depend on i. Do I see it correctly? So, so this term does not depend on i, so I should factorize so it. So you're just counting the combinatorial this factor is, that you need. I, I should have finished this computation. OK, OK. Sorry. Before uh, going further. So this is, uh, because this does depend on this pi, but on, on this i, I just have to count the number of guys here. So I have my sum over pi, which is a finite sum, because when I fix the size of the moments, this uh, set of vertices is fixed and now i have some uh, um, power n uh, terms the one i had before and what is this term it is a number of uh, so it's a number of multi indices that uh, are equivalent to some partition okay and if you count this number Let's say uh, we have uh, this kernel. We must choose one integer for this group, another integer for this one, and a third integer different from the two others for this one. What is the number of choice? It's n, n minus one to take someone different from the previous one. And for this one, n minus two to take an integer different from the two that we have chosen before. And in general, this guy is. Uh, n factorial over n minus the number of uh, the size of this kernel factor that is n times n minus one times n minus two up to uh, what we need okay and this guy is equivalent to n to the number of uh, blocks up to a small error and this is what I, I am going to write plus the number of, block of blocks of MarPy partitions up to a small multiplicative error times a term V L1 Ln of pi, which is independent on, on N. And the power of this method is that, no, we just have to consider the convergence of each terms like this because the sum is finite. And it is quite clear we have a, a finite term which does not depend on n times some power of n. So we must just check when this guy is non-zero, does this guy uh, diverge, goes to zero, zero, or is equal to one? OK, I should have uh, finished this part before going uh, further. OK, so this is the uh, expansion in terms of the entries where we regroup some in some ways the uh, moments in the entries that are the same okay and now we're going to the next step where we take benefit of this uh, graph uh, representation in order to talk about this limit when n goes to infinity okay so i was starting to introduce this but a bit uh, too earlier sorry so what? when you say we must check divergence or not because the v does not depend on n it's just like we need to take care of that uh, you so imagine this uh, exponent yes. is bigger than one yeah, yeah. it means that is uh, equal to, to one or big, bigger or equal to one it means that you have n to some power that would diverge then you should prefer this term to be zero otherwise uh, yeah. the term diverge or there is another term pi which compensates but this is not what happens okay. what happened is that we will prove that when this guy is non-zero this power is either zero or negative. If it is negative, you discard it. It will not contribute in the limit. So you will must then identify for which pi this exponent is zero. They are the terms of order one. Okay? Because if. And this is what we are going to analyze. This. Can we find a nice way to? Just say, yeah, of course, uh, 
It cannot be positive when this is non zero. Yeah, we have one, but we are must explain it a little bit. Okay, more clear. Okay, so how to deal with that? So I will introduce for each pi a graph, which is this one. And I will see clearly on the shape of this graph when this power is zero or when it is negative. And I will see that it, when it is positive, it is actually this term, which is zero. Okay. So this graph, I call it the quotient graph because it's, uh, it's relevant to call it like this, but we don't care today. I denoted T uh, exponent pi. And the idea is that if, like this, you say that my partition put in the same block two vertices like this, and let's say uh, for the picture that three and four are also in the same block, then I will consider the graph where I identify two vertices in the same block, resulting in a single vertex for this guy. This guy is alone. Let me uh, draw the singletons here just to, to have a picture. If it is alone, uh, it's going to create a vertex on its own. This group of two vertices will result in a single vertex and this guy in a single vertex. And now to draw my graph, I need my arrows, my edges, and I just consider uh, the edges which are induced by uh, starting and finishing at the same group. This vertex represents this group. So this edge will come from this one to this one. This is this XL1. This vertex is between these two groups. This uh, um, straight uh, edge start and finish to two different uh, vertices in this picture, but that are the same vertex at the end. So this creates a loop. We can have loop and we can have multiple ages by this process. And we will eventually. And so let me finish that. X, L, four, yeah. X, L, five. And F, X, six. Is it correct? Okay, so this sum is actually a sum over all the quotient graph you can obtain by such a process, okay? And actually this graph, they encode the traffic moments. Classical moments, they are just uh, powers, the expectation of a power. Non-commutative moments, they are expectation of products when the order matters. Traffic moments, they are encoded not by just uh, powers, but by graphs. And by knowing values on each graph like this, we are actually computing moments in the, in the sense of traffic. But we will uh, maybe talk about this tomorrow, but not too much. Yeah. Um, not today. Because this, what we started from, is a moment of a product of non commutative variables. Which guy? What we started from. We started the... from uh, a, a non commutative moment. Yes. And we introduced this weird uh, object. And I'm just claiming that they play the role of a moment in a other theory. Okay. And we made this detour for a reason. It's because it gives us a convenient proof, but we just because to, we need a proof. We don't need this traffic so it's, moment, it's not, uh, just one tool. So it's not only a way to express non, let's say usual non commutative moments to, to count them in a proper way, but you say it, it constructs a, uh -huh. another alternative theory. I start with this proof or with uh, Bernoulli matrices or more general matrices using this and define a theory where this plays a role moment later. And we just see uh, this object right now. Okay. Alors, uh, now that we have uh, this object, we will interpret these quantities where I raise this and this. In terms of this new graph, what we see is that uh, the quantity uh, under SRS is the sum over pi of n to the, so minus one is minus one. What is little n? For this graph or for this graph, it is the number of edges. 
it is the number of ages of the graph T, but it is also the number of ages of the graph T uh, pi because they have the this is quantity is constant. Minus, so let me call the E pi for the, the age set of T pi, and so cardinal of uh, T pi. I denote it, uh, its vertex set V pi and its age set E pi. And now what is the last term? It's the number of blocks of the partition pi. What is it in terms of my graph T pi? Hello? It's the number of vertices. I say if I have one block, it constitutes a vertex of my new graph. Plus the number of vertices. So this is my uh, term, my term of magnitude. I have a small error just uh, coming from the, fa the falling factorial. And then I have uh, some uh, weight, which is uh, independent on A. Okay, it looks good. So what can we use here? We have minus one, minus the number of ages, plus the number of vertices. Does someone know uh, some relation between these uh, quantities for graphs? Euler. Uh -huh. So Euler, maybe you know it, or some people can know it for planar graphs. But here we are not talking about planar graphs. And there is something which is very similar to Euler. Maybe it's different, but I have the feeling that it is more or less the same. It is a characterization of the graphs which are trees. So let's consider a, a generic graph, G uh, like this, V, E. Let's consider a connected graph. Then one, alors, uh, minus one, minus the number of ages plus the number of vertices is negative or is zero with equality if and if. The graph G is a tree. So, do you know this? Are you combined? So this is this looks like weird. So, if you have a tree, what you see is that you can remove one vertex and one branch, you still have a tree. Okay? And you conserve this quantity because you remove a vertex and remove an edge, which means that this quantity is preserved when you take a tree and remove everything up to a last vertex. And if you have a single vertex and no edge, it is true that minus one minus zero plus one is zero. Okay? And now if you have a graph and you know that it is not a tree, that means that you can remove an edge without disconnecting the graph, which means that you have strict inequality. That's it. By recurrence, you, by induction, you prove this. Indeed. So as you can notice, this is not exactly what we have because it's divided by two. So we need another trick, another ID. What we can uh, see is that because the entries are centered, my uh, Wigner matrix entry, so it is another fact that we use together with this lemma. Is that if an age of this Cauchon graph E pi has multiplicity one, multiplicity, multiplicity one, such that uh, there you see this is a multiplicity one. This guy, it is what we call an age of multiplicity two because you have two ages sharing the same uh, uh, extremities. Then the term here will be zero. V of L1, Ln, uh, I of pi is zero. Indeed, remember that we have an expectation of products of random variables, but because we have Wigner matrices, we have uh, independence of entries, 
And having an age of multiplicity one means exactly that you have one term which is independent from all others. So the expectation of this product, you can factorize the expectation of this random variable. And because you assume that the entries are centered, this is zero. Okay? So let's put these two things together. And the finishing time, uh, the proof of the convergence. The, we'll see the interpretation tomorrow. There is a, a, a relevant um, question on the chat, Camille. If you ah, a relevant question. <laughs> By a specialist, Let's... I would say. So. <laughs> Alors, where is it? Anna Sam. In comparing this to the Wigner argument, the key difference possibly independent. So X um, is more involved than... Uh, alors, I did not talk about the classical approach of this before using this. Uh, usually, you know, usually in, there is a lot of people that to deal with this limit, first I assume that the random variable are Gaussian. Why do they assume that they are Gaussian? Because starting from this formula, People don't take benefit of organizing the term with respect to this sum as I explained today, but they use Vic formula for this. Maybe you see that. Vic formula is specific to Gaussian random variables and tells you that when you have an expectation of a product of Gaussian random variables, it's the sum of the product of expectation where you do pa uh, pairings in some way. I'm not going to write this formula. Uh, tomorrow, yes, but not today. Doing that, you get some structure, and you can take benefit of the structure to have the same conclusion. Okay? Here, we don't assume the variables are Gaussian, because if, thanks to this technique, we can avoid that. So I, I think that the, the question is, what is the difference with uh, this, uh, this approach? I think it's okay. And the advantage of this uh, approach is that before we are dealing with that first, we really... Uh, put at the end the treatment of this complicated moment. The only argument we use for this moment is this one, which is not very difficult, uh, arguably. And then let's compute to see what happened. So conclusion, we write minus one minus e pi over two plus v pi. We decompose this by introducing um, uh, what I want, so what I call e pi bar. Well, this is a number of ages forgetting the multiplicity of the ages and assuming that the multiplicity of each age is one. That is, I will replace this double age by one straight age. I forget about the order. And, and if I have an age of multiplicity three, I just, in this bar uh, ensemble, assume I have a single uh, age. So because I, int I introduce this, I intercalate. And to correct my expression, I intercalate this guy here. Plus V pi. Let me uh, just put this parenthesis. And now we have two terms which are negative or zero. Why? This guy is either zero or is negative when this term is non zero, which is the only case that we matter. Okay, because of this argument. All ages much appear with a multiplicity at least two for this weight to be non zero. So this guy is positive and is negative when I have multiplicity three, four, or higher. Moreover, what does that mean for this? We apply the lemma for the graph obtained from t pi by forgetting the multiplicity of the ages. Let's call it the skeleton graph because it's a, okay. And it tells us that the skeleton graph is a tree. So the graph, so let me write this, get zero, and uh, well, zero when the skeleton graph is a tree. 
So the skeleton graph is a tree, and the edges are all multiplicity too. That's the conclusion. That's the conclusion that we'll explore tomorrow to really talk about things. In, in Ibar, the self-loops remain self-loops. There will not be self-loops if these conditions are uh, satisfied. If this guy is zero, if this guy is zero, there is no self-loops. No, no, what I mean is that when you construct the... T pi for C pi, there are some T pi which have loops, but yeah. none of these guys with a loop will contribute. But the skeleton graph, what you call the skeleton oh, graph? It's a loop. You you have a... Yeah, yeah, okay. No, you don't. It's, it is compatible with this. Okay, so let's, uh, it's time, so we must finish. There is a uh, drinks, uh, uh, so we, must, we, don't, uh, we should not be late. Uh, let's conclude that we have proved the convergence to the limit. The limit is given by what we call double trees, because we have the tree with multiplicity two, with multiplicity two. And tomorrow, what we see is that we interpret this double tree formula to make a link with Gaussian random variable in the non-commutative setting. Okay. And if you have questions, we have time to answer it. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. Uh, is there a way to encode the graph in terms of genius? I repeat for you. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. The uh, theory where you have planar object is a theory of unitarily invariant matrices. Yes, exactly. exactly. Um, so basically, is there a way to know that you have to be in the and I don't think so because this is a story for the unitary invariant ensembles. And for uh, so today we consider Wigner matrices. So yes, uh, for Wigner matrices, if you write uh, if you write this approach with the Vic or not uh, trick, you will get that. Yes, but if you pursue this uh, traffic approach, you will have some operations which are specific to these combinatorial graphs. They are not planar graphs. And it will not, in general, be about counting genus because it's not relevant. So I would say that it is different. It is a different combinatorics. They're very similar at the first order. Because at the first order, uh, these double trees, this is just a way to, to get a, a sphere from a, from a Kagon. But if you go into more details, or you consider uh, matrix models, which are not Wigner, but this Bernoulli matrix, you will be much uh, outside this uh, planar uh, combinatorial uh, description. If you find a connection between this, this will be very rich, but for the moment, I'm, I don't think there is something uh, very uh, straightforward to, to connect this. Can you explain what you meant by the double tree? I, I, I just... Yes, but I can also wait tomorrow for uh, uh, having. Uh, I can, of course, but I uh, just wanted to people to be and, relaxed and not. And this uh, fact here, you just. It's just a fact you we didn't prove yet. Also. No, I didn't prove yet. I tried to convince you. Let's. Can we read? Yeah. yeah. So imagine we have a single Wigner matrix. Okay. And we consider not this color because it's uh, terrible. You consider the expectation of one, two times other entity. Exactly. To uh, four to the power four and so on. Okay, but here you have different entries of the matrices. Assume that this number one two appears only here, never later. Okay, you know that the entry one two, so one two is first line, or second column, is independent from all other entries which are not uh, which are not the entry uh, two one. This means that this guy being independent from the other guy, you can factorize this expectation. Okay, let me let me put a, okay, this expectation of this. This you allow it to write this if this entry does not appear on the right hand side. Okay, and if you do so, you factorize the expectation of a centered random variable, so you get zero. You have zero 
times something. So it's zero. Is it more convincing? So it's really a fact that should be justified, but it's not a, you don't need a big proof, huh? just a, an observation. This needs a little bit more detail. That's combinatorics on graph. It's always tricky, even if you, you see that in practice to prove it, it's more, uh, more tricky, but I convince you that the proof by induction works. Other details of these techniques or other commands? Question? Yeah. Uh, Right. Then also on multiplicity means yeah, zero. Absolutely. You don't need that, but imagine you are considering more precise statistics on not the trace like this. You will be happy to use this property and that works. The X matrix uh, are the same, for example. So uh, it leads to the like, usual classical transfer matrix formalism, yes? The usual what? Uh, usual classical transfer matrix formalism to solve the. Uh, uh, I matrix. don't know what is the usual transfer matrix formula. Uh, Sorry. The old... We get the uh, Catalan numbers. <laughs> no, it's not to your question. So let's go back to your question. Uh, uh, here you uh, erased the notation of the uh, ML uh, one to uh, L. Why? And yes, uh, here you wrote that the, is the expectation value uh -huh. is this uh, trace of the uh, multiplication of the absolutely. X. Yes. Okay. You're considering uh, the same matrix, so I guess yes, you want to consider. All are the same. You want so, to consider the expectation of the normalized trace mm -hmm. of uh, matrix to some power, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. Cool. And so you were mentioning a classical formula that is not classical for me. Though. So this guy, you know that it converges to the case Catalan number. Okay, I don't know if everyone knows what is a Catalan number. It's a 2n over n and there is another n somewhere. Is that it? Well, more or less. We will check. It's a k. It's the number of double trees with two k ages. We'll see that tomorrow. So you had a question, <laughs> is it? Uh... Uh, uh, the expectation value of the, the whole matrix uh, is the uh, expected, is the uh, diagonalization of the X, just the matrix case. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, the problem could, could be solved, right? There is no need to think of all the... Uh, the uh -huh. good. If, you, you, okay, good. I mean, this is the possibility for the if you know the formula for eigenvalues of a GUI matrix and you assume the matrix is GUI, mm -hmm. uh huh. So, uh, the problem is sure. the software. It's not the problem we consider today, but yes, if you know, if you know how the distribution of eigenvalues, you have a formula for the for this. We does not use this kind of combinatorics. Mm -hmm. This is a different way. Yeah. So I think uh, time to have a drink. Cool. Merci. Cool, cool. I took my time, so it was better. Ça va? Attends, j'enlève ça.